everyone. Welcome to Weekly Wealth at Business School of AI. Weekly Wealth is a happy place to share, learn, discuss, and explore. Weekly Wealth occurs every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm your host, Yash Aswini Vishwanath, and you can call me Yash. I'm logging from Bangalore, India, and I would like to know where you're all coming from. Please type away your name and location, and we would like to get to know you better. I work here as technical lead, and I'm specifically learning AI and focusing on AI ethics. I'm student of Sudha in her AI ethics class. I was a past student and present student. At Weekly Web, we generally invite speakers uh, all over the world to share the learnings and experiences with us. I come from uh, working in product management and in analytics. So in my last role six years back, I ended up heading uh, mobile analytics. So people think of analytics as there is data and you look at the data, visualize the data, make sense of the data with some insights. And the data is telling a story and you say, hey, data says this set of customers have a higher propensity to buy this product than this other set of customers. So all of us here at Business School of AI, when we are learning to build AI, we are thinking, hey, we are going to use this data to build those models. I want you to take a step back. Instead of just thinking the data is going to tell a story, the way you get started if you're a new business with data is you set the right metrics. So there's a saying, what you measure is what you can manage, or I'm far paraphrasing that a little bit. So if the CEO of the company says, we are going to measure uh, engagement of the customers, then everybody in the company is going to say, how can we bring customers to come back more number of times so that they stay engaged? So for example, Apple, when they launched the iPhone, one of the metric that are, are their top metric was not how many phones they would sell. They basically said, we have created the app store and uh, developers can uh, submit apps and we'll approve it. And you can sell those apps at whatever price you think is right. And we are going to be a marketplace and, and use this device to go do this. But the, me the measurement or the metric that they use is they say, how much money did we pay out to the developers? I found that very, very fascinating, maybe because of uh, analytics background, because as soon as they said that, everybody in the company is trying, is getting focused to make the developers successful. And of course, the developer, if they charge 10 bucks, Apple gets to keep uh, three bucks out of that. So it's, it's not that, hey, we need to optimize our revenue out of developers or we need to sell so many number of, uh, of uh, devices. They started publishing how much payout have they given out to developers. And they started saying, now we have reached billion dollars that we have given out to developers. And so it's a very inspiring number, right? So similarly, a company, what they start measuring is what everybody's going to run towards. So if you think about this, this is, a, uh, this is an issue everybody in Silicon Valley is running towards to say, okay, we've built, we've come up with this awesome technology. Now we want to find the right customers, sell them the right thing, operationalize it so that we get the right, uh, what is called MVP, uh, minimum viable product. And from there we can go, right? So to get there, let's look at how the engineering department is going to measure metrics. What is engineering department going to do in autonomous vehicle delivery bot company? What is their role? Um, chat guys, put it in the chat, okay? So Suresh is from Bay Area, Kevin is from Bay Area. Lot of people from uh, San Jose and San Francisco Bay Area today. We have not got too many of our friends from, uh, from Europe or India. Okay. Um, we even have somebody who comes us from uh, comes here from Czech Republic and from Nigeria. So hopefully those people will join us and on this fun topic. So my question to you is: If you are working in actually building technically, you don't need to be technologists to visualize. You know that's the beauty of uh, being a business person. You can put yourself in everybody's shoes and say, "Hmm, if I'm the customer, I would do this, and if I'm the supplier, I would do that." Or, you know, I'm your uh, business partner and we start to do a BD uh, deal. This could be a question they could ask. 
So um, let's let's loosen up our imagination. Maybe some of you are engineers. I see some engineers in the room. So when you're building an autonomous vehicle, and that's the business of the company, and you're building that uh, uh, autonomous delivery bot. Now, what is engineering's role in that? Um, Dan is a consumer scientist. Thank you. Oh, you're in LA today. Okay. Um, awesome, Dan. Um, so talk to me. So if you're in, a, if you're in uh, engineering, what is your role? Emmanuel, how oh, you're here from Boston. So good. So we have somebody outside of Bay Area today. Good. Um, it, so um, chat your answers, guys. What What is the role of engineering? So if you're in engineering and you're the company that makes autonomous delivery, not even delivery, autonomous mini robots, what is your role? What are your, What is engineering's role? Chat your answers. Wouldn't it be an engineer to say that? Make the bot? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, and make the bot means build the product to meet the specification. There goes Suresh because Suresh has been doing this in our meetings and saying, okay, what is the specification? How do you measure that? Um, okay. Uh, to serve the customer's needs. Serve the customer's needs is what everybody is doing. But specifically, I'm looking at what is engineering department role compared to marketing or anything else. So engineering department is, is and serving the customer needs is what everybody does. But for uh, uh, engineering, it means making the product, right? Um, Ananya came from being an engineer and transition to a product manager. So she's actually saying, as an engineer, mm -hmm. I would think... Um, how to build per specification, right? Um, design, develop, and deploy. Yes. So it all comes, and for an autonomous uh, bot, you have to make it autonomous. It is not just engineering to build uh, build the parts or build the software, but you need to build the autonomy. So let me um, show you here. This is from wave.ai, and I have no um, affiliation with them. I like to give credit where credit is due, but I'm, you know, not attached to any brand or uh, any other, any company. So if you're measuring autonomy, so you build the bot, we are building the, the physics, the, of the mechanical, electrical parts, and you put this, put together this box, which is going to become the robot. Now you need to bring it to life to drive autonomously, to move autonomously. Maybe it has an arm. Maybe it is lifting and picking things. Maybe it is just moving around like a mini self-driving car. So how do you measure autonomy? How do you measure the performance? And everybody here who, who as an engineer wrote in the chat, it is not just building the bot. It is building that to specification. And then it is not just building, but deploying and, and sending it out to the customers. So here is about how you would measure autonomy performance from zero to one. So here, because the bot, in this case, it's autonomous, it is going to see using computer vision. So they're saying, okay, let us look at, we are going to use ImageNet images. This is actually a, a very famous computer vision image uh, data set, public data set that's used for training autonomous systems to understand images and look at things. So cameras, autonomous vehicles, everything that can see is going to use ImageNet. So that's the starting point. So engineering says, okay, we're going to use ImageNet and we are going to build some AI model. And so this is what they're saying. So they are saying the same thing. This, that which is measured improves is kind of a variation of what they're saying, right? So they're sitting and looking at uh, how the autonomy is improving. So they're building a, a classification algorithm and they're understanding images as a starting point. And then the image is going to understand when they build the first AI algorithm, maybe it has you know 27% accuracy, then it, they improve the accuracy and it keeps improving. So internally they're saying, hey, are we getting better in recognizing objects as a starting point? And that's how they're going, right? And, and they're using this image net for autonomy. So then this goes on to say, okay, so how do you think of the problem from an engineering perspective? You have to break it down and it has to be flexible enough. 
and then you have to make it to be autonomous so i don't want to harp too much on what engineering is doing because i wanted to show one department engineering how they're thinking about this and they're going to deploy an autonomous fleet so they're saying okay we are going to start with curating we're going to start with collecting the data curating the data which is labeling the data and getting it ready then we get the training and then they keep running the simulation and evaluate with to specification and then they send it to the road all this they are doing internally and then they send it to the road and that's what we see here as you know the autonomous oh, vehicle wow. then they measure the performance and they keep improving that in a cycle as a training ai and then it becomes the um, re- the learning ai ready to come the inference model and then the learning ai ready to come to the customer so they have listed that and then how do we build that learning loop and so now they're going to integrate that piece of software put it in the vehicle collect the data performance evaluation and all right so uh here they have said okay sorry uh let's do this so this is what it looks like when it's trying to understand the lane and say ah i need to stay within the lane stay within the lane it adapts and this is one of the simulation what they're doing right so uh so you get the idea that they are looking to check at every stage now they're saying okay it is uh, following a sing- it is looking at a single lane and it is following the lane and we run this for 1000 attempts 99.9% was okay and here is you know how we got it over time then let's check for left turn and we'll try that for 1000 times okay how where is it then we'll check for right turn and then we'll look for a simple traffic light where that it can recognize the traffic light and it's supposed to stop does it stop and then there's a rounder mode does the so that's how they break it down before they get out to the real world right so uh so that is what engineering is doing engineering is building but it is building to a specification and the specification must be hey we need to be at 99% percent until then they have to iterate and do this and then we saw all the steps they go through and then they test it and that's the kind of metrics which is very granular this is about serving the customer but to get the customer they need to build the the bot they need to deploy it at the right time so now i want to show you uh actually i'll ask you so if you are not an engineer suppose you are in finance what what are, what metrics will you run towards let's do this fast like a a, a quick round so if you work in finance and you are part of this company which is building autonomous mini robots and you are going to um what are you measuring revenue thank you uh if you are in marketing what are you measuring um api is revenue we got a guess so please mute the mic okay so um so we are just so we are talking about autonomous um, mini robots from a product management lens and i have got another um five more minutes so let's make this fast so i need to give this to uh, ananya so my role here is to get you thinking about what is a product manager lens because we are going to get this product manager is going to go very fast and and wow us and teach us how to look at autonomous uh, vehicle mini robot space from a product management lens so we spoke about engineering is role is to build the robot we are talking about metrics what metrics each department is going to be thinking about so we said engineering is look uh, role is to measure the bot we, we, and i showed you how to look at autonomy how they are looking at autonomy and building it so that they can build it to specification scale it and get ready for deployment right that's where they are so and finance says i'm here to measure revenue they have not sold anything there's no revenue yet but they said here are our kpis here are uh, how how much revenue we want to make i'm going to go tell investors and how, and how are we tracking towards that um okay marketing is um creating an impression to the world about the technology okay that's good um it's also doing competitive positioning and reaching the market um uh, thank you suresh and um, dan is saying whether enough consumers will pay per unit to cover product engineering cost and give them a firm healthy mar- margin that means 
somebody is measuring what is the cost in engineering building this product right and 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 they are finding the per unit cost i am not sure you know whether you can understand the per unit cost when you just get started so when you build the first unit you're going to it's going to cost a lot and if you're going to sell that unit it's going to be expensive that's why pricing from startups are typically much higher and then when they scale and they're able to produce in large volume then the cost go down but the bill of material or the cost of making it is one thing and the cost per unit including engineering time software development time and all the other overheads essentially creates cost per unit so good point so um, we need to know the cost per unit so is that something finance is tracking that's what you're saying that okay okay um so what is marketing doing is marketing building the tracking the cost per unit or our marketing is just building the channel to the customers okay what about sales what is sales tracking to what is sales tracking to okay sales is meeting the sales target who is setting the sales target so here is a company it has engineers who are building and they have set some specification and they said this is the standard with which we are going to build this quality standard performance standard here so we are going to make sure it's autonomous we're testing it and they've measured how much it costs to build it's pretty expensive marketing is saying okay let me go and tell the world this awesome technology is coming and let's go build channels to reach our customers um and sales says okay we have our revenue target we are going to go try and sell this as soon as engineering give this gives this to us and uh, finance is saying i'm waiting for the revenues to come and measuring the me revenue okay so far lot of different metrics okay ceo tests sets the target leads per quarter meeting the sales target okay fine so the ceo is the person who's bringing this together and is going to say here's a sales target guys now go sell it and make that many unit marketing go tell the world and build channels and so everybody has different different metrics so uh, for specifically for autonomous vehicle uh, a fleet company uh, they track to five metrics so as a business metrics this is assuming okay this business is here and all these different people as departments as we're talking are working towards various things and let me share what a typical fleet business does so they have in this case they have trucks it could be autonomous trucks for the purpose of our discussion right so uh they would track the fleet utilization so if they build 100 100 units they would and and people said hey it has to be built to a uh, specification what does that look like so they usually say okay we'll do mile, mileage management what is the cost of building a truck and what is the cost per revenue of the truck so suppose the truck costs 100 100 or the autonomous robot in our case right suppose it costs 100 and you're selling it for you're able to sell it the market can only take it at 50 so your cost is going to be 100 over 50 which is not good so you need to say uh, sell at least two trucks for break even right uh, or you could say hey this is going to run for so many miles suppose they're going to do delivery they're going to do something as a service business then you do the cost per revenue and it has and again it has to be fuel efficient so then you actually look for which are those vehicles which are not performing well what is wrong with them and you you monitor the actual drivers and you fix that another common metric is the vehicle utilization rate suppose you have to build this in bulk and you brought 100 of this you made 100 trucks then how much are they utilized if you're sending this to customers sending it on a lease mm. are they at 100% utilization is what you're going for so the utilization rate is a common metric that any kind of uh, fleet company uh, ends up using and then of course you want to make sure if there's maintenance of it and repair for it how much does it cost and things like that and the final thing is uh, uh, is there a business model by which you utilize your technology to your advantage which is you know monitoring the driver behavior or whether you're geofencing for a specific neighborhood like robot taxis do and the like so when all yeah. this as the company scales who actually owns the customer who is actually the ceo of the customer 
who's thinking about this, not just operationally bringing it, finance go make money, accounting go measure this, HR build this culture, and, and uh, engineering go build this uh, to specification, and marketing, let's go reach customers and sales go sell it, which could be an operationally a CEO would do, but who is the CEO of the customer? That is the role of product management. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Ananya, who knows to be the CEO of the customer because she transitioned from engineering to product management. Okay, so Ananya, I need to make you co-host and then the floor is yours. Okay, so now talk to us about the... So Ananya, Ananya Sen, do you want to come on, on camera for a minute and then maybe you can move out if you don't want Hi, uh, I'm super excited because I've seen you go from engineer to product management on a transition in a very methodical way. And now you are the product manager who knows to delight customers, become the CEO of the customer. So talk to us and tell us about what, how a company should look at this. What is the state of you know, AV mini uh, autonomous vehicle market space, but how do you look at it as a product manager to delight customers? while you have all these people around you with different, different metrics and measurement and goals, finally saying, hey, we are all working for the customers. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ananya. Anonymous mini robot space uh, recently be uh, has become very popular for last mile deliveries and same day deliveries, uh, especially with the whole uh, pandemic perspective. And I'm Ananya Sen, uh, again, uh, more than a decade of engineering experience in several uh, domains, uh, fintech, e-commerce, uh, developer productivity, and recently moved into product management uh, for uh, fraud detection and analytics space at Threat Metrics. Um, and that's me. And today, I would like to quickly cover uh, how we think about uh, uh, a problem when you're trying to boil it down to an MVP use case. So to de demystify this acronym, I think acronyms are very, very popular in the industry, given that there are so many. So MVP, for those of you who are curious, it's minimum viable product. So the, the thinnest slice of delight that we can provide our customers or stakeholders to have a complete benefit. So it could be like very small. It could be even a simple form, which is uh, say uh, capturing um, a consumer research uh, question, like one of our audiences here. So MVP, minimum viable product. So how do we find an MVP use case for an autonomous uh, mini robot? So that's the question I want us to think, of, think about. And then I'll let do a quick uh, landscape, uh, competitive, uh, not a full analysis, but uh, how many players are there and of course the technology that makes this robot so resilient and of course is is there a, a few go-to frameworks to go about finding that prime use case that can help us deliver value so yeah when we uh, even in class when we are thinking about how to boil down to this use case, it's always great to understand what's the problem and what's the economics around it and what's the market space. Um, so today, 2021, we are just uh, recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and the entire world has seen several trends. But some of the key trends are this uh, increased desire to get food delivery, grocery delivery. We deliver everything to our door and that has increased uh, delivery vehicles by 36% in 
emissions, of course. Uh, we are at the brink of uh, global warming and emissions are now increasing. And of course, there is traffic congestions. So these are some serious problems and a few of those elements that must have um, contributed to a complete explosion of this autonomous mini robots delivery robot space. So who are the players? There are many, and I've just listed a few here. And they come in so many different form factors based on their use cases. So we have KiwiBot. Uh, actually, Sudha's class, we met up KiwiBot in San Jose. It's currently deployed in uh, three other, so four total uh, cities. Amazon just launched the Scout bot. And there are many other players, a uh, Starship, has been around. Um, I've actually met a starship at, uh, at Intuit in Mountain View, and it's very curious to play around with it, standing around it. Um, Uber, FedEx, and there are also some bigger form factors, as you see um, in Korea, 7 Eleven uh, partnered with. Uh, a robotics company to build out a bigger form factor to deliver um, not just groceries, but actually like other consumer goods. And of course, there are much bigger ones, Neuro, uh, Neuro um, FedEx partners with Neuro, but it can bring multiple groceries, um, maybe to an office uh, uh, apartment complex or something like that. And there are indoor bigger form factors as, as well, uh, like Rakuten here. So the curious thing is there are so many and they are constantly increasing. And the landscape is a little fragmented. Uh, so we don't have a dominant, um, Monot uh, a monopolistic player yet. So again, a little bit of the market perspective, this is quite a big market and constantly growing. And thus it's catering to multiple um, industries. So retail, hospitality, um, healthcare, and also providing some great uh, data for our cities and communities to help improve our uh, roadside community experience. Okay, so now uh, once we understand the market, um, we also need to now deep dive into how would we um, improve the business and it de depends on the life cycle of the product really. Uh, so for product life cycle, if it's a new product, it would be a completely different dynamics. If it's an existing, then we're thinking uh, for the incremental uh, value additions. But it's, uh, it's important to understand what uh, we want to work with. So the robot unit is, again, uh, we, uh, the, the complexity of the robot will uh, determine the autonomy level. So whether it's an L2 or an L3. So um, an L4 complete autonomy is not achieved yet, I believe. Um, so for example, KiwiBot, the one we're working on in class is an L3 autonomy, which means that they, it's autonomous, it's, it's following its own navigation system, but it does have a human um, remotely monitoring. So a human would remotely monitor like multiple 
uh, bots to make sure that they're okay, they didn't topple on the sidewalk or something like that. Um, we saw different form factors. Mostly they use cellular connectivity and they have to account for different uh, poor connectivity corners. And we just learned that KiwiBot is actually experimenting with uh, a couple of SIM cards, uh, how to optimize that. So that adds complexity. And of course, there are all these different sensors, cameras, th uh, 3D LIDARs. And underneath, tying all of this together would be AI models and computer vision technology. And while we have this cute little uh, autonomous mini robots uh, walking around in the sidewalks, delivering food and whatnot, it's also um, recording a lot of images constantly and we are concerned about privacy. So these uh, robots have technology to blur out uh, personal information like the face of a person or the number plate of a car and other things. So the technology is available and it needs to get implemented in an acceptable way. And um, Sudha and we are also big on the ethics part of it and how to build the AI with more um, ethics and responsible AI aspects. On the other side, we have to tie in, um, of course, to always start with the problem for the, for the business. And the business model, so for example, KiwiBot is a, a it, it moved from a B2C to a, a, a B2B model. So that's kind of the model uh, is in critical and one may need to iterate to survive the market. And of course, partnerships uh, with uh, the technology landscape today, nobody can build everything. So partnerships are key. And of course, we have a lot of sales and marketing folks here as well. So uh, a lot of data-driven data operations and sales and marketing that we need. So for a product manager, the the trick that I'm learning is how to align with all of these components to build that small, meaningful delight. Um, so yeah, aligning with so many stakeholders, teams, um, and keeping the final North Star uh, vision in mind is key. But again, you'd go back to like you do need to understand the technology a bit because then you need to align um, say supply chain team or some other teams for it. So again, going back to the autonomous uh, mini delivery bots that we're talking about, as you can see, it has multiple sensors, um, ultrasound sensors, LIDARs, cameras, they're usually slow and that is actually good for safety. So six kilometers per hour is what this spec says. They of course have um, AI models to detect obstacles on the sidewalks. And some are even becoming very cool. They, uh, some can climb a curb, uh, the FedEx, uh, same day bot, it actually uh, climbs a stair and we were just talking to the, um, the data lead at Keyboard yesterday and uh, there could be many such uh, fun um, features that we could add to uh, many of these um, bots. So again, I pulled in another um, example of uh, one of these delivery bots. So I have quite a few KiwiBot 
um, examples because we are researching this uh, space for that, but you could really apply these to all of the other uh, mini bots uh, depending on their specific uh, needs. So the form factor usually really changes depending on what we want to deliver and at how many to how many customers. So, and then that kind of decides what would be the platform design and how many wheels and how much connectivity and a lot of those other things. Um, of course, we touched upon the privacy need. Um, consumer privacy is, is prime um, in the world today. And of course, we have a lot of AI and CV tech to adhere to that. And of course, reliability metrics, um, Suresh here would tell you how critical these are. And of course, we, we, me we can improve only what we measure. So uh, MTTBF, uh, MTTR, re some reliab uh, reliability metrics that we would need to iterate and improve these bots to meet. Um, Okay, I am running low on time. So let's chat in the questions, but I'm going to keep going. Um, so yeah, as you saw, when we're trying to come boil down to like just one use case for such an AV uh, mini robot, how do we get to it? So there are many frameworks out there and um, we follow the 4P methodology that Sudha has a very simple one, which ties in the business problem, the customer pain, the persona and the potential solution. I mean, among all these words, the persona for uh, many might be familiar, but it's essentially the actual end user who would experience the solution. So, the 4P method kind of gives us this uh, simple framework to step-by-step step iterate and refine the, the landscape and find the requirements and boil down to the, the couple of most meaningful use cases. But of course, there are other frameworks to do uh, customer discovery, uh, product discovery. Um, namely say design thinking, lean methodology, and it's all uh, very based on VOC. So that's voice of the customer. So since we are building for some customers, some persona, uh, some delight, we it's really important to keep us in line by constantly having a test with uh, what the customer has to say about it. So gathering feedback constantly. Um, yeah, so a quick story. I think I've experienced this multiple times, whether it was for a FinTech use case or a fraud use case now. Um, it is highly beneficial to uh, talk to the customers, um, understand the problem space, align it with the uh, business. And in design thinking exercises, there is uh, this uh, ideation phase where uh, we get to brainstorm together with other thought leaders. So say the services, the market planning folks, the engineering team, um, and kind of lay out this, these are the pro uh, customer problems. And this is how we as the business tries to prioritize it. But oh, every other thought leader team has very valuable inputs and we can actually together collect them and prioritize them and, act, and um, figure out those most critical few that we can go ahead and build. And I keep saying the MVP, the few, because it's very expensive to build the whole cycle of um, figuring out 
um, how we would sell a product or actually how we would build from scratch takes a lot of cycles, lots, lots, lot of uh, design and uh, so many team members would be building it and um, there is rigorous testing, you may need to test just for SLAs or for performance, scalability, so many aspects, it takes time. And since we want to collect quick feedback, uh, it's critical to reduce this time to feedback. And that's the idea in this lean methodology. So this is a little bit beyond the 4P because this is these are frameworks to actually go build and launch uh, but yeah check out these frameworks and there are a few more many well not many more but few popular more but these really help us to uh, build quickly and gather feedback quickly from the customers so are are we uh, using some of these um methodologies in in class for the wake for the autonomous uh, mini robot uh, exercise that we are doing with um, no code AI and um, some data science aspects. Uh, yes, we have started to do that. And I would like to showcase one of the examples we did have uh, we do have multiple um, ideas from our brainstorming session and uh, a few of us in this audience uh, are part of that class and there are some very other popular um, examples like say detect the pollution, the air quality or um, figure out if there is um, a, a broken sidewalk or uh, garbage that didn't get collected or, or uh, say, say graffiti. This is uh, something that Suresh brought up yesterday. Um, so we have some great thought leaders uh, when we collect different ideas during brainstorming, but the Example that I would highlight here is just one of them. So again, going back to the market research, uh, we found that in this case, Kiwi bot, and we could do this for any other uh, of the AV mini bots. Um, they have an ongoing partnership with the city and um, the Knight Foundation and Shopify. So we figured what could be their next best uh, new gig. And one idea was what about assisted home facilities? Um, what if it could be an assistant to just bring quick things or medication from the kitchen or the nurse's station? Um, so yeah, again, uh, bringing in uh, the business problem, the customer pain, always very important, understanding the different stakeholders that we need to cater to is critical to uh, for communication, for gathering the requirements, the feedback. And of course, all of this uh, sh ideally should revolve around one or two persona the person, the end user who would actually experience the solution. And that brings us to the use cases, the specific um, benefit that the persona would experience. Uh, this is an example and we're still working on boiling down the use cases and not yet close to getting to the MVP use case. But, but this gives you a glimpse of cert a certain way to think about. Um... Uh, hey, Ananya, uh, since we are coming to the end of our uh, time, can I just make sure that we get some of the questions answered? 
Yes, and, please. Okay, yes, do please. you want to stop Actually, sharing? Yeah. Can you, yeah, can you yeah. stop sharing? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so one question Dan has is, uh, when it comes to delivery robots, there are seven or eight competitors and maybe one or two are actually, you know, surviving possibly. So when you're talking about getting customer feedback, are you thinking of getting feedback for, suppose you are part of one of the two surviving companies, are you getting feedback for your company, for your customers only, or are you going to look at, hey, what did the other seven or eight do? And to make sure that, you know, the consumers will ultimately choose your product over the others. So uh, there are a couple of ways, of course, um, what I have experienced so far, and I'm still learning being new to the, the role. Um, our customers and understand what the competition is doing. And often when we focus on our customers, we actually do see what is, uh, are they using other uh, solutions in their journey that we can partner with or tie up with. Uh, example, um, we call it um, follow me homes. And uh, well, this is an Intuit term, but it's similar. You go talk to the customer or find somebody very close to the customer. Um, so in many B2B companies, it might be the services folks or the support team, uh, but understand what the customer pain is, what's really causing them to be excited to use our product. And of course, when we go talk to them, they might, they might actually tell us that, hey, you know, this particular use case, I'm not really able to figure out. So I'm using this other tool to get it done. And then we get that uh, moment of like, oh, okay. Um, is that a complementary tool? Then should we think about partnering it? Because it doesn't make sense to build all the time. Um, but yeah, short answer is um, better to keep it simple. We cannot do too much. Um, so if we definitely, I have seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've seen it's good to start with our own customers if we already have a few. And then, of course, keep the competition in mind because um, if we don't innovate, we don't survive. So, yeah. Uh, Ananya, can I just add a comment? Yes, uh, I have, my journey is I moved from engineering to PM, stayed as a PM for the longest time, and then I moved to analytics. So I see, I have seen that the, the smaller the company, everybody in the company in every different department is trying to compare with competition. So engineering would say, hey, they are designing it this way, or they have this better efficiency or something, or what they can see outwardly, right? People are always looking at it uh, from various different departments. And the PM tries to bring it together for their product. And then the PM, a smart PM, would be plugged into the market so they would know what's going on. So I remember in eBay, we had 400 PMs in the company and we had a mailing list of PMs. They were obsessed with what every single feature that was coming from every possible competition, new perceived, new startups. They're always tracking it and say, ah, they're doing this. We should do that. We cannot do this because of this other limitation or whatever, right? They're constantly analyzing. But when we measured, we were always measuring only the uh, the actual our own metrics, our own customer metrics. Yeah. Okay. So Suresh has this long discussion with me about vision. Who sets the vision of the company? And if you have vision, does that mean that they've reached a certain mature state? So I was talking about how you companies pivot again and again and again till they arrive at the right customer product fit. So where does vision play into that? Uh. For me, the vision really helps to keep it simple. And uh, that's how I think about it. But it goes back to the whole OKR mechanism. Like what is what what are we building for? Uh, in this case, um, same day local half mile delivery where we want to reduce air pollution by too many delivery vehicles. Um, and that's not a vision statement, but that's the problem. And um, if, if we want to kind of 
I think KiwiBot has the vision something like uh, a community friendly uh, robot delivering uh, food, right? Um, so yeah, it helps kind of test ourselves whenever we may you know, delineate from building for the vision. So what do you think? And others, please chime in, like, uh, or unmute and, yeah. So there are, uh, you know, I've seen that companies have a vision, they start off and then as, and they would say that uh, in this case, they would say, we want to deliver, right? Deliver food, make it easy for the customers or something like that. Then an opportunity to could come and they could partner with somebody. So I was curious from a business development standpoint, when you're building partnership with somebody and you take the, the company to a totally different market, then the vision should switch. So the vision should be something bigger, right? In, in Kiwibot's case, they want to build a socially acceptable robot, period. Yeah, socially. That is delivering food happens to be the use case they are going after and they seem to be making progress on that. Tomorrow, mm-hmm. I don't know anything about uh, this. I'm not speaking for Kiwibot. Any of the robots that you listed in there, when FedEx says, oh, I'm going to go uh, de- deliver things, they could buy one of the companies that is in the space. I, I remember DoorDash, that's food delivery here in San Jose. They are not a robot company. It's just a food delivery app. And you and uh, real people come and deliver uh, food from restaurants. They went through this exercise of wanting to get robots to do the last mile delivery. So they ended up buying a company which was doing auton- which is building autonomous vehicles. So this company was building autonomous vehicles and saying that, hey, we are going to build AV robots. And then at some point, the company decided to sell and, and uh, DoorDash bought them. And then they said they are our autonomous vehicle business unit, but they did not launch anything. So we don't know what they're doing inside. So maybe they're testing, maybe they decided to switch focus or do something else. So in that case, the vision of this company now is aligned with DoorDash as a business unit and say, okay, now we have to deliver food. And earlier their plan was not to deliver food. So that's the pivot piece, I think. How do you, how do you manage that when you pivot as a product manager? What's your role when you pivot? How, who decides the pivot? We, uh, yeah, product manager does play a key role in deciding the pivot and pivot is uh, very important. Uh, So the vision usually should be defined that it doesn't need to change, but the actual strategy um, that might iterate and that's the pivot. And we get to learn that when we build in the measuring mechanisms and the feedback loops uh, and the voice of the customer kind of feedback loops in the um, whole process. Yeah, so ultimately for a particular um, product or a particular feature line depends on different companies. Uh, yeah, the product manager would be asked to give the final word on the on the pivot, but it's always a teamwork. It's always like aligning with all the different pieces. Uh, okay, uh, Emmanuel engineering and and then move to business development. So, Emmanuel, do you want to comment on that? Uh, do you feel free to to unmute and speak up if you want? Yeah, one second. Can you yeah. guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Well, I mean, I think it depends on the type of pivot, but I mean, in the case of what you mentioned, uh, the company that was bought by, by uh, DoorDash, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure that somebody that whomever was running that company made the decision, yeah, I would rather get the money and, uh, and sell it to, to another company and then align with that with that company. So I would say... My expectation is uh, most of the times, if if the owner or the executive team, whomever that, um, whomever has the power over the entire operation of the company is gonna decide, hey, one day we're a software company, the next day we're a hardware company, the next day we're whatever company makes money. Um, I mean, I think now in terms of that gives the, the high level, but then I think, you know the details are left to 
um, you know, the people that manage manage the business. And it really depends on the size of the company. Of course, if you're working at eBay, it's totally different than if you're working for a, you know, for a startup. Um, so, but I think I would say the overall trend of where the company is going is always decided by the, what I call the ownership or, or the executive team, whomever, whomever sets the direction for the company itself. Okay. Um, thank you, Emmanuel. I have a question for, uh, for Ananya. So um, from whenever we talk to engineers, the, because of this, maybe their mindset is never to build one thing. They are never ready to build one thing that cannot scale. When you're building an MVP, uh, when you do the spec with engineering, and I've been guilty of that in my past too, they would say, tell me what all we would be doing with this. And maybe you're talking about uh, delivery on the sidewalk. Is it going to stay only in the sidewalk? One day, is it going to run on the road? Or is the sidewalk limited to a road or is it going to run inside a mall? So let me plan accordingly because you cannot keep changing the engineering. It will take time. So the engineer's mindset is always think in a scalable fashion, right? And so how do you deal with it when you're saying, let's focus, we're going after this customer and this is the set of products and this is the, the pivot we are at. We're not talking about changing the pivot. How do you how do you keep bring that to a product instead of a scalable can be many product because it'll confuse the customer if you expose all that features out to customers? I that's an excellent question, Sudha. And whether the AV mini bot or other applications, we always face that. Um, I think the way at least I try to do it is of course when we know the market and the trends. It's, it's not too volatile, right? So we have a little bit of time frame. So we cannot build for 10 years, but we could build for the year. But, um, but that has a risk of uh, spending too much time building it perfect. So the way I try to do is uh, the particular use case, say this bot needs to run on the sidewalks. But in the future, we should be able to train it for an indoor use case, say shopping mall. So when, um, when I have that discussion with the engineering time during, uh, say, viability, feasibility kind of discussions, or even, um, yeah, this is before the design, right? What that helps is, uh, they do design, uh, we are able to design in a little bit more flexible way. But uh, as a product manager, uh, I really need to kind of help us focus on the particular use case at hand. So sidewalk, right? What that helps is Sure, we designed, we took in some of the corner cases into perspective, but we are now building. So, so for a for a mini bot use case, I mean, we, we still need to uh, add the right sensors or build the right, uh, pick the right um, navigation system, AI, and it would brought. Uh, uh, it might vary across a sidewalk and indoor shopping mall. So, so we now focus the, the design and the building on that particular use case, not the scaled one. And we test for that. Uh, we train the model for that. So, so yeah, I guess a little bit of uh, next couple of steps perspective helps in those feasibility and initial dis, um, design discussions, but then focusing the resources to the specific helps. I'm sorry, that's a long answer, but uh, but yeah. yeah, I try not to do just what we need to do it right now. If I already know that this might break the next one coming up in six months, so um, yeah, yeah, that's actually a good answer. Though it's a long answer, it's it's more close to the truth. 
So I find that, you know, I, a lot of our students want to move to product management and they're working in comparable roles and they kind of eventually become PMs. Um, and I find that there is no one PM role in Silicon Valley. There is a PM role. And of course, in consumer tech versus B2B, there is difference. And then I found between East Coast and West Coast, there was a difference within, within US. And when I talk to somebody from Europe, they have, you know, a different scope of how the PM role fits in with the rest of the organization. So maybe it's a very engineering heavy um, in Silicon Valley compared to business heavy in some other places was my my uh, personal observation. So um, I want to ask Suresh's question that he's been chatting here is when KiwiBot says the vision is a socially acceptable robot, uh, does that mean that people are having security in a uh, city? Is that socially acceptable? Uh, in that case, then can you then then can you consider making it into a security bot? So you know when they have a vision, how what does that translate to as product? Does that give them enough room uh, to change to pivot to a different space from food delivery to now become a security robot, but still in within the confines of hey, we are socially acceptable robot. I would think about like, what's the problem we are chasing? Like, uh, yeah, and it's really sensitive to the current time. So uh, last couple of years we have seen the, in the pandemic, you've seen extremely high demand for uh, say food delivery, grocery delivery, and that kind of overrode the other use case for that time, like um, targeting global warming or, or uh, being the, the city cop kind of things was not that much of big of a deal. So you have to pick the demand, pick the problem. Um, can it actually become? Technically, maybe, but do we want to, want to actually train it for it? It really depends. Uh, and it always goes back to the business uh, problem and creating a value for the actual for the business. So, I mean, uh, if if the need arises, if there is a complete outcry, there is a lot of demand for that multitasking. We could invest in that, but it's not easy to just do ten different things. We won't do anything well. So, it's important to focus on the customer problem. I, yeah. uh, can I? Can I? Uh, yes. Can I answer this. Thing? I think it's getting a little more clearer, at least to me. Uh, so what is happening is the, there is a company vision. Now, you know, in a company vision, to be generic, it says delight customers, okay? Whatever that means, right? Now, that is where they go to the next step of making it a mission, right? They say, okay, I'm going to delight customers by giving candy, or I'm going to delight customers by giving free coupons, or I'm going to... Now, and so... Uh, you know, once uh, the people are bought into the vision and mission, that is what the whole company aligns on, right? They say, I'm going to delight customers with buying candies, which means the product manager can go and say, okay, these are the candies that people might like, or these are the uh, candies that we can build. And he goes and does that, right? Now, let's say come uh, five months or one year from now, they pivot another strategy and say, ah, delight customer also means buying a coffee cake, for instance, right? So the mission, the vision is still delight customers, but the mission is, you know, coffee cakes, right? And so, you know, the company aligns to that mission and says, okay, what are all we need to do? You know, the product sales and marketing, you know, they align to. Now, one level uh, below that is all the values that comes into the company, right? The uh, company says, if I want to delight customers uh, by giving them candies, uh, maybe what we need to do is, you know, here are the five values that, the, you know, uh, you know, it's at a more granular level. Maybe, you know, we want to increase the revenue by delighting customers. We want to increase whatever, right? So not, uh, not, not give them diabetes, not care about their health. Exactly. Right. So I think that is where the hierarchy of uh, vision, mission and uh, company values flows in and how all the employees align to that particular uh, and strategies come in play after that, uh, you know, uh, by delighting customers or delighting, uh, 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 what do you say, the investors, for instance, who knows, right? Delighting the investors, maybe, you know, increasing the revenue, 
things like that. I mean, it's a very, it's a rambling maybe, but I think I see somehow that might be the... Uh, no, I, actually, rambling. Suresh, uh, you, you make a very good point. I remember when I was early on in my career and hear about this is the vision and the CEO says that we will believe it. Then somewhere mid-career when we've had this, this is the, the vision, this is the mission, let's go build this. At some point, there was a disconnect because we would be working on it and they would say, we're going to trash that product. We're going to go do this other thing. At a division level, it, uh, or especially in engineering, it used to be very disheartening that now we are, like all our work has been thrown away. So let me give you an example. Facial recognition systems are being built by tech companies. Awesome. And one of them, you know, three of them, like Amazon, um, IBM, Microsoft, all of them have built it. Even today, facial recognition systems are, are pretty buggy, right? They are very biased and they don't do their job right for catering to everybody. It's very unethical. So they got slapped by regulation, had to shut down. So Amazon, uh, IBM, and Microsoft, all three were asked to get rid of their facial recognition software from the market. IBM immediately said, oh my God, this is unethical. We do not want to do this. At least this was their public statement. And they, they shelved it. Everybody within that business unit was reassigned. So if you are in engineering and they say, our vision was to build facial recognition technology to go do whatever, right? They must have said something or at some mission level, they said, we are going to build the best facial recognition technology. Now, when they had to shelve it, and the people had to be reassigned. They said, you know, to do computer vision. Now let's go uh, look at, uh, you know, repair of uh, light poles. And the same person's technology could be repurposed, but they're going to be very sad about it because they had this grand vision of doing facial recognition to, you know, look for lost children or something, right? And now they're fixing uh, energy poles is not as cool, right? So I've seen that, and that would have happened in IBM, right? Then the other two companies, Microsoft said they didn't want to lose the engineers and dissolution them. They said, we are going to put this project on hold. We are going to draw funding away from it, but we will come back when we get the regulation to okay it. So which is kind of a milder approach. And the third thing, what Amazon said is Amazon absolutely did not want to listen to this, did not want to, you know, mess up their engineers or lose the lead to the market. So they needed to pivot. Amazon said, okay, we won't sell this. We will wait for a year and we'll continue working on it internally. And so if you think about it, what to Ananya's point, if there's a PM sitting in one of them says, oh, they have not given up on it. They are still working. They are going to be ahead of us. We should not be doing this. And they would be fighting the case in IBM or asking for funding in Microsoft. And the engineers in one would jump ship and try to go to the other. So that is where it all gets chaotic. At a, I'm thinking at a big company level because most of my life I worked in big companies. Um, so I find that you know pivoting seems like a um, culture shock problem more than just building a match to that. Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're saying very right, Prasada. So basically, in, in, in all of these companies, maybe the vision is to help uh, you know public or customers and security yeah. folks, right? And so, you know, at one point of time, they decided, okay, facial recognition was the way to go and their mission was to build facial recognition products. So they, they all did it, but then they discovered that there is an issue with that. And so the mission changed. Maybe we're going to help light poles, for instance, uh, fixing the light poles, right? So now they're all working on that now. Uh, so everybody's aligning to that particular mission and may, maybe they'll come back and update the mission later on. So I think that's what it is. You're so right. the, right. so a, an experienced engineer like you, who has seen this shift in one place, when they're asked to build computer vision product and they say, we are going to do this for facial recognition would say, wait a minute, tell me what is the specification? Where all could you potentially go? So that is how the junior engineer becomes a more experienced engineer who can work across the business and maybe become the CTO or something. And they would say, tell me all possible directions this could go so that we engineer it and build it so that it is scalable. So tomorrow you switch from here to the other, then we are ready. So uh, we are reaching the end of our time. And uh, Ananya, when she was called to speak about this because she did this in class. And I thought this was such a fantastic topic because we were having this discussion about uh, starting with a business problem, arriving at a problem statement to build AI. And we were looking at multiple use cases and Ananya wore her PM hat and started bringing this 
approach of product discovery and you know understanding the market and all that stuff so thank you for coming and talking to us um and you had i thought you know this was this would be too much of time given that you know you were kind of saying you know i don't have much to talk about you're very modest about it so i want to bring this to a close and i have a question uh and i and uh, i don't know if i should put ananya on the spot but i will open it up and if ananya wants to answer she'll have the last word so as we are looking at autonomous vehicle space over the years i started out with the business of self driving car course and then you know adapted to autonomous vehicles because i realized oh no it's not just about the car this vehicle could be doing anything and they change the form factor it it goes to different industries and a person like ananya could come in and make us do different things with it we that time we did not have food delivery you know when we got started with all that so my question is there's a whole car industry which is selling cars to consumers and they're selling cars and we track something called value chain so the product is made in the car company and it is sold to dealers and then it from there it comes to consumers right so that's the value chain of how it reaches consumers it's not i'm not buying directly from the car company i'm calling coming through a dealer so there's a dealer network and so that exists and it's billions of dollars from existing car companies now when autonomous vehicles came or at least the technology of this came and there are many many companies trying to do all kinds of interesting things with autonomous vehicles some of them are saying hey we'll become robot taxis so and some of them are saying we are going to be software on wheels and we are going into mining and something else how does the industry change so one of the things uh, i keep hearing is the business model of who will pay for the autonomous vehicle is not solved for that's why you know all these delivery bots are saying maybe we'll do fedex delivery maybe we'll do food delivery maybe we'll you know be a support robot moving around helping uh, seniors and you know various possibilities right so that problem of how they are going to solve is not yet solved so one common thread i hear is it's going to be some kind of shared mobility because remember we started out with the metric it's going to be expensive to build these autonomous vehicles so the utility metric of it has to have 100 time 100% up time to cover the cost of it is going to drive that which means it has to be shared that's why we have like ubers and and uh, lifts and you know uh, blah blah cars and they are all saying hey we'll get to autonomous delivery one day uh that would how we'll have 100% utilization because a human is not driving and go to bed and and we have to have another driver running at night and so they look at the utility as one metric as the very big metric of of autonomous vehicles so coming back car companies are selling to consumers and their brand is tied to whatever they think whether it's a safety car or whether it's a utility car or rugged terrain vehicle and things like that right so the consumer buys based on that then the autonomous vehicles come in and say now we are going to do delivery for food we are going to do this that various other things right then if it is shared mobility is going to switch to a b2b market right because now they have to sell to fleets and then the fleets would go manage the delivery that's what there's a fleet of vehicle from kiwibot fleet of vehicle from fedex fleet of vehicle from amazon and the like so if it is going to become that kind of b2b business um yesterday tesla shares went up to uh, sold up uh because hertz decided to bunch, buy bunch of uh, tesla cars huge number and uh, it was a, a uh, it was b2b uh bulk sale right and here tesla has been selling to individuals who are raving by it and you know they have built up the whole market and now there's a huge uh, volume sale of a fleet that they have sold of course they will have to add fleet management software and engineering is going to go do those things as the the pivot for that extra market but my question to you is if you are selling to consumers as a business which is what auto company is now if they are going to become a b2b business and switch is that a pivot or is it something totally different is it like a huge market transition or as a pm if you're sitting in one of the car companies and you say i go through the dealer network sell it to to consumers i'm at mercedes benz or i'm at uh, volvo or any of the car companies right gm toyota ford any of them right um and then you're like okay now we are going to become this autonomous vehicle selling a huge fleet so how does that switch happen if you are the pm in tesla who's selling to consumers and you say happy news our shares are going up because now we're selling it to a fleet is that a pivot 
how would you deal? Do you look that as a parallel product or is it a pivot for the company? What, what, what would your approach be in this product discovery as a PM? That's my question. Um, you want me to take it or? Uh, yes, yes. So oh. Cam, is, Cam is commenting that it's a strategy change, not a vision change, but I'm not okay. going to beat up the vision with uh, track. We did, did a lot of discussion on that. Ananya as a speaker gets the last word. Oh, um, so great question. Uh, I would say B2C and B2B are quite different from dynamics, from revenue perspectives, from the end user uh, persona thinking, it, they are very, very different. And if uh, an established B2C company like Tesla um, is strategizing at building a new um, B2B fleet um, partnership, a B2B uh, branch, then I would say, I would agree um, with Cam, it's, it's not, it, it could be an iteration uh, a pivot in the strategy, but they would be quite different. They would need to be in their own orgs because the dynamics is totally different. How we measure success would be different. Um, uh, the deployment cycles would be different. Um, the, again, as you said, the management software would be different. Um, so yeah, I mean, I vision. I mean, in a in a B two B end of the day, the fleets uh, would get ha, would uh, have a human end user, so it could end up to be uh, a B two B two C as well. Sometimes, um, if the vision is broad enough, like uh, a socially acceptable robot a socially uh, delighting car or uh, whatnot, it might still fit in, but yeah, it, it's, it, they're two different. I, I would consider it as two different parallel, parallel branches now that need to be managed. That's a very good point. We had, I remember in, in, in PayPal, um, it's a consumer business. And then, you know, when they decided to go after large merchants when we, and I was involved in opening up uh, API as a PM for the platform side. Uh, they, and then they came up with more and more ways by which they can go work with banks, they can work on, on the B2B side. They ended up hiring a new set of PMs who were B2B PMs, a new set of PMs who were focused on B2C. So our customer our, was, was a, a, a certain narrowed focus and their customers were certain narrowed focus. Overall, somebody drove the brand and strategy. So marketing must be doing something you know, finance and the bigger company was thinking, but from a peer perspective, this was our customer. So that is why I love the idea that a PM is always focused on the customer. So if you switch customers, the PM either goes with it or the PM leaves jobs and say, this is the kind of customers I'm used to and I'm going to go serve them. So that's why PM is the uh, CEO of the customer. So you prove that right beautifully. Thank you very much. And I, I, as I'm closing this, I just want to remind people from what we have heard today, uh, if the car industry is going to go from a B2, uh, B2C to a B2B and it's a huge shift, it just means that we are nowhere near done. So if you're, if you're excited about autonomous vehicle with all our talk, come on in. And if you're thinking of something else where you're going to bring your experience from any other industry, there is so much room. And it's not just the AV space. This whole idea of being a PM and owning the customer is... I always say start with the customer problem. What is the, who's the customer? What's the problem you're solving? And, and stick to that. So I tend to bring all my class discussions back to that. It seems like a cliche, but that's, that's a great starting point. So when you're building AI, AV or anywhere else, if you know who's your customer, what problem you're solving, what is the potential way you could solve? Why does it matter? What's the pain point? You can arrive and then look at the data. You will all make sense. And then you can say, okay, now let's go build AI. And then you turn around and start talking to the data scientist who would say, tell me again, who's the customer? Why not this other customer? Today you're saying this is the customer. Tomorrow I'm going to change to the other customer. I want to build a scalable model. So it goes back to the, the same iteration. Thank you for joining Weekly Red. Weekly Red is a happy place to share, learn, explore and happens every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. 
Catch you at the next weekly vet. Bye bye.